Well, it's this long trajectory of us learning about stuff that people do or stuff that happens that turn out not to be somebody's responsibility. Like somewhere, I don't know, back when, uh, if you and I were like 500 years ago and we were the same sensible, self-reflective, vague, heady people we are right now or whatever, um, I meant that we almost certainly would have believed that if a lightning storm comes completely out of nowhere and destroys everyone's crops, it was because of witchcraft. A witch caused that to happen. A witch exercised free will and chose for that storm to happen and come and kill your crops or poison your well or some such thing. And then at some point we figured out, no, that's not actually like lightning storms like that are not caused by old women with no teeth. And so it doesn't make sense to burn them at the stake anymore. Wow, that's good. We've just managed to make the world more humane. And we've even understood a little bit about where thunderstorms don't come from. And then, you know, a century later, people are believing throughout Western Europe that an epileptic seizure is a sign of demonic possession and go and burn them at the stakes and the usual sort of things. And then it wasn't until early 19th century that people learned, no, actually, this is kind of like a disease. This is like you're impaired because you broke your leg. Yeah, we can understand that in terms of construction items. You're impaired because, you know, once a month, potassium channels in this part of your brain get all hysterical. And suddenly that had nothing to do with Satan. And this was not only a more efficacious way of learning how to treat epilepsy, but it was a more humane one. It's kind of nice that we're not burning people at the stake anymore for presumably sleeping with Satan. And we've just done that over and over somewhere in the 1970s, people figured out that Freudianly screwed up, hostile, toxic mothers are not the cause of schizophrenia. It's a neurogenetic disorder. And suddenly, generations of women who were told by doctors, you, you were the cause of your child's schizophrenia, even though I know you consciously tonight, you've, you've always hated your child. That was the psychoanalytic, psychodynamic stance on it. So we've been freed of that, and we're, I don't know, 20 years into being freed from some kids' eyes flip, below, flip around closed-loop letters, and as a result, they have trouble learning to read. They have dyslexia, and we learned that's not because they're lazy and unmotivated. It's because they've got screwy wiring in this one layer of one part of their cortex, and as a result, they have trouble distinguishing Bs from Ds. And in each case, like, not only hasn't the roof come in, but we've gotten better at figuring out how to deal with some of these limitations. Um, but most of all, the world's become a nicer place, a more humane place. It's very good that we don't tell kids with dyslexia that they're lazy and unmotivated. It's like, this is a better planet as a result. And all these other cases as well. But then how does this, though, relate to, I guess, the second part of my question, which was, like, the crimes associated with epilepsy. So I have car crashes in mind and how we ought to treat them in the criminal justice system. Well, you're not crimes. They have no place in the criminal justice system. You get somebody who's driving along, has no history of epilepsy, and suddenly from out of nowhere, they have a grand mal seizure, abuse control of the car and hit and kill somebody. There is a responsibility there. This is not a matter for the criminal justice system. Um, and that was not the case 50 years ago or 100 years ago. There's been tremendous progress there. And what you do instead is you constrain the person. You try to keep society safe from them. You say something like, okay, now that we have you on meds, you need to go six months seizure-free before we'll reinstate your driver's license. Does this connect with what you call the or refer to as the quarantine model of criminology? Yeah, exactly. And this is, you know, this is very enlightened 
form of thinking with this. Um, you know, if you really believe this no free will stuff, none of us are entitled to anything. None of us have earned anything. None of us deserve anything. There is nothing about you that makes you and your needs more worthy of consideration than that of any other human out there. Um, and, you know, this is kind of challenging. And, like, you can't praise anyone. You can't blame anyone. You can't reward. You can't punish. Taken to its logical conclusion. And one downside of this is, you know, the perception immediately that, oh, you're just going to have murderers running around on the streets because they're not responsible for their actions. Absolutely not. Um, you constrain them. You make sure they're not hurting people anymore, but you constrain it in a way that's intellectually completely disconnected from like a notion of blame or causality. And we know how to do this. Like if you have a car whose brakes are broken, it's dangerous. Maybe the brakes failed and it killed someone. And this is totally terrible and a nightmare and all of that, but it's not the car's fault. And if you can't fix the brakes, you were able to protect society from that car without telling the car it's got a rotten soul. Put it in a garage, you can't drive it anymore. But you don't go in every day with a sledgehammer and bash the car across the hood as punishment for it having hit that person. No. And we're capable of doing that in the human realm as well. We do this, you know, here's this setting where here's a person who's dangerous to others. They're dangerous and you need to protect people from them. And we have learned how to constrain them in a non-judgmental way that does not invoke free will at all. If your kid is sneezing a lot, don't send them to kindergarten tomorrow. They ask you if your child has a nose cold, keep them home from pre-K and kindergarten. And so you do that. You quarantine them. But... You don't forbid them with playing with their toys that day because they sneezed all over everyone yesterday. It's got nothing to do with that. And, you know, you were able to now not only, like, save the world from kids sneezing all over the kids sitting next to them, but you're not telling kids they've got rotten souls if they sneezed on someone. And this has got to be the model system that we are using in all these cases, a quarantine model. You make sure somebody is not damaging to anyone around them. Second, you don't constrain them an inch more than that. There is no such thing as punishment as a virtue in and of itself. Um, the third thing, you don't preach to them about how you're doing this because they've got a lousy soul. And the fourth is like a classic public health dictum of that point that you now have as much of a responsibility to go figure out where does that harm come from? Why do some people wind up being that way? Why do kids get nose colds and how you can avoid that? So you protect society from them. You don't do anything more than is necessary. You don't preach to the person. And like you don't like claim that somehow this is like a societal good at the end. <laughs> <laughs>